I'm delighted to be joined here today by Joe Kaplinksy to talk about his new book, Energize. So Joe, can you give us an overview of the book? For example, why did you call it Energize? Sure. Uh, title's pretty straightforward. That uh, you know, When we looked at the whole discussion around energy, which seems to come up all the time nowadays, the conclusion we came to is the real problem is that the world needs to generate a lot more energy. So uh, a lot of other people seem to think that the main problem is climate change, for example, and we thought that's really the wrong starting point. Uh, it's a bit like looking at the problem through the wrong end of the telescope. Uh, instead of taking climate change as the starting point, uh, what we're taking is the uh, need for innovation in energy, the creation of a lot more infrastructure. Uh, for example, uh, all the calls nowadays for people to consume less and use less energy, uh, you know, we think is uh, wrong-headed. The answer to that is to produce as much as people need. And another thing that we wanted to look at is, you know, what are the limits and the barriers to producing a lot more energy today? So a lot of environmentalists will say that the problems are natural limits like running out of oil uh, or putting too much stress on ecosystems and so on. Uh, and what we wanted to explore is, you know, what are the real uh, political and economic and social limits to generating a lot more energy so that those can be overcome and we can help people move past them. Yeah, you mentioned how it's a big social issue at the moment. I mean, there's quite a lot of fear surrounding it. Do you talk about that in your book at all? We talk about fear and risk quite extensively because it comes up again and again, mm -hmm. certainly when you look at uh, energy and, of course, also nowadays in, in many other issues. Uh, I mean, a good example is around nuclear energy, where there are many fears of risk. And even in uh, kind of new technologies that were once considered green, like biofuels, when people start talking about genetically engineered biofuels, again, the whole question of risk and fear comes up, holding up those new technologies. So trying to look at what's behind that and respond to a lot of those arguments uh, is quite central to the book. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's more due to the media coverage of uh, energy resources and the whole issue around that? Do you think it's more due to political sort of issues like uh, government policies? Well, I think the politicians really have to take uh, much more or most of the responsibility here. Uh, I mean, they like to pass off responsibility, blame the media, mm. blame public opinion. But I think there's a really severe failure of leadership, uh, certainly amongst politicians today. Uh, there's a real need for them to uh, stand up and make the case for new infrastructure, new energy. Uh, if the present lot won't do that, then we need some new politicians, perhaps. Uh, but at the moment, they seem to be much happier telling us all how we have to tighten our belts, sacrifice. You know, they love the Second World War, rationing, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, very easy because it's uh, what they're really doing is trying to say, well, actually, uh, you know, you'll have to make do with less rather than trying to work out how we can produce more. Mm -hmm. I mean, the government's planning, in, or I think they've already passed a law that will introduce, or sorry, enforce energy efficient light bulbs throughout society and ban like the 100 watt one. Do you think that's a suitable and sensible idea? Yeah, that's the EU legislation mm -hmm. coming in later this year. Uh, I think that really typifies and sums up the approach that we want to be critical of. Because not only do light bulbs use a relatively small uh, proportion of the energy in the world, uh, but that idea of trying to kind of here and there just uh, reduce a, a bit of energy consumption and kind of scrape through and all the rest of it, uh, it totally ignores uh, the fact that, you know, to do more, society has consistently used more energy. Uh, you know, if you look at the amount of energy that the developing world will need to come up to the same standard of living that we have here, uh, I mean, it's very clear that we will need to generate, you know, maybe uh, more than twice, four times as much energy as, as we are at the moment. Uh, and if we put that investment into energy generation, then there's really no need to, uh, for people to uh, be constantly worried, constantly thinking about their everyday decisions. Uh, and that's, that's the approach that we want to hold up because we think that that in the end is a more realistic way of allowing people to actually live their lives the way they want to. Mm -hmm. I came across something called green misanthropes, mm -hmm. misanthropes I think they were called in your book. Can you explain that a bit further for me? What are they? Yeah, well misanthrope is uh, uh, just the word that means, uh, you know, hates humanity, hates mm -hmm. people. Uh, and we use that really to label a few of the environmentalists who we're critical of. So they 
always see people as the problem rather than the solution. So they're always seeing people as polluting, creating waste, destroying the environment, you know, and never seeing people as a source of creative solutions, new inventions, uh, new sources of energy. Uh, and the second is a real disregard for people's desires and the way they want to live their life. So they seem very happy introducing new regulations, bans on light bulbs, telling people how to live, uh, which really represents a, quite a contemptuous approach, really, to uh, how people want to live and what they want to do with themselves. Uh, so for those reasons, we call them misanthropes, and we've got a selection in the book. Yeah, very funny. Um, what about global warming? We really make two points about climate. The first point is that climate change is certainly influenced by human emissions of carbon dioxide from energy, amongst other things, uh, and that's now reasonably understood. Uh, but the pace of that climate change is not the catastrophic disaster movie that a lot of Greens are going to uh, paint and going to tell you. Uh, it's a fairly well understood process that's going to uh, unfold over the next few decades, over the next century. And so we've got time to restructure our energy supply and clean it up over the next 50 years or so, uh, as is necessary. Uh, and the second point that we make about climate change and global warming uh, is that even with this warming, uh, even at the pace it proceeds, it's likely to be a lot less catastrophic than many Greens suspect because human beings are actually quite adaptable to changes in temperature. Uh, and even if the world warms up three degrees, say, uh, you know, people will be quite capable of solving all the problems like uh, drought or disease and famine, floods, all the things the Greens say will be catastrophes caused by climate. If we have sufficient economic development, we have sufficient innovation, then people are going to flourish in that warmer world anyway. So uh, the end conclusion really is that climate change is a problem that we're going to take in our stride as we produce more energy, rather than something that we should see as the defining challenge of our times. Mm -hmm. And finally, where and when could we pick this book up from the shops? Uh, okay, well it should be available in all good bookshops online and on the streets. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, if it isn't, please order it and encourage the booksellers to uh, get it into stock. Thank you very much.